Bases dropped on a lovely Wednesday morning here in Metro Atlanta, June 19th. Soccer down here, live on a Wall Pass Wednesday. We take your questions on a Wall Pass Wednesday. We do that via Twitter, at Soccer Down Here. Use the hashtag, be part of the conversation. There's a lot to talk about. Atlanta United last night, 3-2 winners over the Columbus Crew in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup Round of 16, they will be hosting the quarterfinal match on July 10th at Fifth Third Bank Stadium in Kennesaw against the winner of tonight's match in St. Louis. St. Louis FC hosting FC Cincinnati. U.S. Men's National Team won last night late after 10 o'clock kickoff uh, against Guyana. It was a 4-0 win. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's the opener to the Gold Cup. It wasn't maybe the most inspiring performance, but it wasn't a bad one. Don't know how much we really learned after it. We'll hear from Greg Berhalter in a little bit with some of his post-match comments. Let's uh, let's start with Atlanta United and fall out from last night's win. Uh, it was a weird game. It was a cup game. It kind of had a weird feel to it. You had a, a lightning delay in the middle of it for a little over 40 minutes. That affected the rhythm. It was contentious, and there were some things that happened after the final whistle. Uh, Pro Soccer USA reporter, uh, do you have the name in front of you in Columbus? Dialing up the article here. Uh, To the top, to the top, to the top. Ben Faree. Ben Faree for Pro Soccer USA um, had a very... Interesting tweet, and then some more detail from Caleb Porter. And I'm a little surprised by the the statement. Um, things were thrown at the referee crew after the, the final whistle, and we talked about this when it happens everywhere, and we're going to talk about it today. Uh, Caleb Porter... His comments are not something that U.S. soccer or especially the professional referees organization would like to see made. Uh, First, he said they trial officials in this competition and see how they do, and it's disappointing. You need high-level officials that know how to smell a game and manage a game. Guido Gonzalez is a referee that some don't like, some like, but he is a referee who has managed MLS matches before, and he's been involved as a video assistant referee many, many times. He's been a fourth official many, many times. It's not the same trial official that you might see at some points. Um, The next line is the one that I have a problem with. He says, you can't throw stuff at officials, obviously, but, and, and in brackets, the reaction was normal. No, it's not normal. I'm going to assume that Caleb Porter is not saying that it's normal to throw things at officials. I'm going to assume that this was said after a match. It's heated. He went on to say, in a game like this where it's do or die, you win or advance, you lose or go home, there's a lot of emotion. It happens where at the end of a game people voice their opinions and then they get out of there. I'm guessing the, they get out of there as the referees. I don't I don't know if they're supposed to stand there and wait till everybody has had their say and then they can leave. I, I don't know. The uh, the thing about throwing stuff at officials, I think Caleb Porter knows better than to say that the way it comes out in the printed word. Now, we have not heard audio of this, so we don't know kind of how it felt. But just to be clear, it, it's not normal to throw stuff at officials. It's not okay, and condoning it is, is never a good look. Um, I'm going to hope that's not what was going on here. It was a game where there were a lot of fouls. It was very physical. It's also a wet field, which plays into it to a degree. I'm a little surprised by some of this. When you look at a match that saw Ezekiel Barco and Pitti Martinez fouled nine times, many other times kicked, not called, but fouled nine times out of 22 total fouls for the crew. There's been complaints I have seen about Leandro Gonzalez-Perez trying to clear a ball off the line with a bicycle kick attempt. 
and a Columbus player coming in from behind him that he can't see. Guido Gonzalez did not make the call in that situation. He didn't call anything. I think that's absolutely the right thing to call there. I, I don't know why it's it's thought that the defender should just not play that. He is entitled to it, and the, the Columbus player is putting so, himself in harm's way when he sees what the attempted clearance is, and that's the game. I mean, it's do or die. It's win or advance. It's lose or go home. It's everything that Caleb Porter said it is. I don't know what you're supposed to be looking for there. Um, there's also a contentious situation around the first goal that Columbus scored. I don't think it's really there. I think it's a little overblown. Um, Darlington Nagby was down. Still not sure what happened to him. He continued the match. Uh, he did not leave the field for any significant period of time. Columbus scored. I didn't have a problem with them continuing the play. Atlanta United players did, obviously, as they should. And there was some pushing and shoving afterwards with that, and it calmed down. Nobody was red carded, and I, I think you know we've talked about this in matches before. Uh, Mark Geiger, World Cup 2018, England, Colombia. He got out of there 11 v 11, and, and that's seen kind of as a win in a lot of ways. Same here. Nobody was sent off. The players decided the match on the field, and on the night, the better team won. I, I think that's what you want in these situations if you're the referee. Was it an easy game to manage? No, not at all. But saying things like this after the match, and even if it's inadvertent, and I'm going to hope that it was, saying that you can't throw stuff at officials, obviously, but, and in brackets, the reaction... So I don't know how that came across in the, the audio part of this. But brackets, the reaction, unbrackets, was normal. It's not normal, and it's not okay to say that it's normal. And that's that's something that I hope does not continue and does not... I hope that it gets questioned. I think Professional Referees Organization Pro is going to have to question that statement. The liaison for officials earlier in the article from Free setting up the Porter quote now, said what, it's hold pathetic. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold, hold, hold. One thing, because nobody knows what a referee liaison is in this situation, and it's an important okay. aspect of it. Um, I haven't managed an Open Cup match at this level. My understanding, if it's the same as, as my previous experiences in these types of competitions, a referee liaison is either, and in this case I'm going to assume that they're not, um, sometimes they're a team employee, other times they're a volunteer, and generally they're a volunteer from the referee community because they, they know how, how the referees operate. They might have worked with the referees before. They, they know what the referees need. I mean, this is the person that's in charge of walking with them after the match in, in place of security, if, if they don't need security, making sure they have everything they need in the, the locker room. If, if there's any questions or anything they need to get, this is the person that helps them out. They are a member of the referee community. And after a situation like that, where things were thrown, and we saw in the broadcast that there were multiple players very, I mean, aggressive in, in, in Guido Gonzalez's face. Not aggressive that I think they wanted to like do anything, but they were yelling and they were very upset. A member of the referee community would be defending their fellow referees, as you would expect. So yes. it, it's it's not a a U.S. soccer employee, it's more than likely in this case not a Columbus Crew employee, it's not an MLS employee. It's it's a volunteer generally, and they are a referee, and they are helping their fellow referees. Now, what was the quote from the, the liaison that was not named in the article? Yes, it's pathetic. It's ruining the beautiful game. This game isn't that important to try and cause physical harm to someone. I remember back in the day, people used to throw batteries at my guys in this stadium. You can't have that happen. It's ruining the game. There will be punishment for this. People will get banned. And if it continues, you'll eventually have games in empty stadiums, end quote. That's a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hope you don't have games in empty stadiums, and, and I hope it doesn't continue. Uh, going back to what you said about people throwing batteries at, at people in that stadium, I've never heard of anything like that. I've never heard of a referee on American soil having a, raf a, a battery thrown at them. Um, if it's happened, it hasn't been very well publicized. <sighs> it's like anything, though. If there is video of people throwing things at the referees, they will be banned. And it's up to Columbus as to how long, but they will be banned. Yeah, absolutely. That part's 100% true. 
Um, it's a bad look, and and it's never okay, even in a game that is do or die or contentious or a cup game or winner take all and all the different things. That doesn't make this normal. It doesn't, and it's it's going to be interesting to see what the fallout is. I think if this had been a higher profile game with a bigger crowd, one, if it had been a bigger crowd, maybe it doesn't happen. Because when it's a smaller crowd, maybe they, you think you can kind of get away with it because there's nobody there. I I don't think that's going to happen. And I do think there will be questions about that. I think there will be questions about security. And I think there will be questions about Caleb Porter's post-match comments. Um, these are things that are just not acceptable in in the game, period. It's not okay to say that this is okay. And... Until I have more context, the reaction in brackets, I will attribute that to fans yelling and finger pointing and doing expletives. That, but once again, this is not having any audio. The yeah, emotion so. is what. Absolutely. Yeah. At face value, the bracketed, the reaction, I will attribute to the emotion of the moment and not anything past that i hope that's what it is but if it's to the idea of caleb porter saying yeah it's cool to do that to officials then no it's not okay and no I don't and think, porter yeah, needs to I, I don't think that's what he said i i, I agree I, I think that would have been specifically quoted if it had been a little more clear but the the lack of clarity yeah it's it's an issue um I'm with you. I, I think he, I think they're talking about the overall reaction of the emotion of it is normal, and it is saying things. Yes, yeah, not ideal, but people say things in the stands at referees all the time. Referees are used to that. That's fine. Throwing things at them is a whole different ball game. And I mean, we've seen it. In other leagues and other competitions and other countries and things like that. And I did do a search for Montfrey Stadium batteries thrown and have not come up with anything yet. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of anything like that. I, I hope that's maybe somebody with emotions running high. Um, Columbus Crew officials released a statement after the match that read, Guests who fail to abide by the code of conduct as determined by stadium management may be ejected from the facility subject to arrest and or banned from further events. There was also the situation with Justin Merrim um, as he was leaving the field and was booed by members of the crowd. And I do not think it was the majority, but it happened. And, and Justin Merrim tweeted about it. And we talked about it on our post-match show last night. Um, somebody said it was classy that he went over and applauded their, their supporters as he came onto the field. And he said, because I only have love for this club and city, but the booze as I was subbing off, question mark, question mark, eight years for this club, LOL, I won't forget it. It's a it's shame. Um, again, I think it's a, a very small subset, and I don't know why anybody would be mad because Justin Merrim was traded to Atlanta. He wasn't playing for Columbus. I don't think he would be playing now. Maybe with the injury to Federico Higuain, things would have opened up with Pedro Santos moving inside, but it'd be Merrim, it'd be Rubinho, it'd be Argudo all fighting for that playing time. And I, I don't know if Merrim, where he was at the time before the trade, would have automatically gotten that opportunity. So, I mean, it feels like a move that benefited both sides. I think it's a shame that people would be booing him after eight years that he gave to that club. It, it's... It's a cup game. Emotions are running high. I think we all understand that. It's a shame that these are the talking points coming out of it because it was a, an entertaining match. It was, uh, I wouldn't say well played, but the emotion of it, the intensity of it was really good. Hard to have a well played match in the conditions as the night went on. Um, the field held up about as well as it could. I mean, it, it was pouring. <laughs> it was yeah. raining really hard for a long period of time so it wasn't as bad nearly as bad as the match back in march and hopefully next time atlanta goes to columbus it's not raining like this that would be nice <laughs> i mean even in in 18 before the match and it it cleared up by the time the match kicked off uh -huh. it was a ridiculous downpour as we were pulling into the stadium late in the afternoon so 
Maybe one day it will be a dry uh, day in Columbus. We'll see. I just, I, I think Atlanta United did the job here. It, it wasn't the prettiest of performances, but again, it's Brandon Vasquez making the most of the opportunity, and and both goals for him were were workmanlike kind of goals. I mean, the first one, it's a poor touch, pounces on it, good finish to beat John Kempen. Second one, it's a long ball over the top by Leandro Gonzalez Perez. Gives Vasquez a 1v1 with Cronale. And the little shoulder turn, he loses Cronale. And Vasquez is just putting the ball into the back post because Ezekiel Barco is charging in and it finds the back of the net itself. It's, it's great work from Brandon Vasquez. And I thought more impressive than the two goals from him was just the overall quality of play. Because he was involved as a number nine. He was playing back to goal. He was making good runs off the ball. I was really impressed with Brandon Vasquez on the night. Outside of, of Brandon and, and Justin Merrim, and I think Merrim will be a player that will be pushing for first-team minutes, this was an absolute first-team lineup. So to see those guys get this opportunity and play well with the first-team group, it's a good sign. Because as we talked about on the post-match show last night, starting on Wednesday, Atlanta United will have nine matches in a month's time between June 26th and July 26th. You're going to have to have Brandon Vasquez contribute. You're going to have to have Brandon Vasquez probably start in Toronto on Wednesday. You're going to have to get contributions from Justin Merrim and others in this team because that's a lot of matches in a short period of time and against a lot of top quality opponents. Atlanta United will completely be tested in that run. And this cup run, and there will be a quarterfinal match as part of it, was really important, I think, to getting ready for that. I think Atlanta wanted to make a run in this tournament because they want to win a trophy. But I think Frank DeBoer also really wanted this game in the middle of this break to be able to keep preparing his group going forward. In my mind, I thought Atlanta, when they were good last night, were really good. I thought when they were sloppy, they were pretty sloppy. You want more consistency, but the highs were, were very good last night. I was very happy to see that. And the fight was there. That was able to overcome some of the mistakes. You're going to need both. You're going to need all of that as you go forward. Frank DeBoer post-match, he says, we're only going for one thing, and that's to win the Cup, the U.S. Open Cup. It's nice to go through to the next round because you can only win the cup if you advance to the next round. We want to win MLS Cup and U.S. Open Cup. That's our objective. And next time we'll play at home, and that's an advantage. Hopefully the supporters will be back supporting us in an empty stadium. It was tough. Hopefully in a month we have a lot of supporters that will support us and help us achieve another record moving on to the next round. Hopefully we can achieve that. And his comments on Vasquez after the match. Uh, I think you can see tonight he was challenging. He was winning duels. He was sometimes a focal point where guys can play to him, and he'll play to guys under him. He was also clever tonight, like on that shot when he hit the post. He sees the defenders trying to pass back. He gets in between that pass. I think he had a very good performance. Yeah, and as a number nine, it, it's that's been the, the most interesting thing about Brandon Vasquez in 2019 to me is – under Tata Martino, we saw Brandon Vasquez as a winger. He was out wide on the right primarily in the the four two three one. Didn't really see him as a number nine, and in the three five two, we didn't really see Vasquez. Four two three one, he was out wide and was effective out wide. Was effective. His one v one ability is good for his size, especially. Kind of has a little bit of uh, Kenny Cooper, if you remember the former FC Dallas forward, former U.S. men's national team forward, a, a big guy that looks like a prototype for a number nine, but has good feet and can play out wide and likes to get out wide and run at people. Vasquez has that, but he also has that size and that strength, and he can be a true number nine when called upon, and that's what he had played coming up. That's what he played with the youth national teams. That's what he played at Cholos. This is a, a really nice situation for Vasquez now. And, and there's been a lot of questions about, oh, well, so that means it's the end of Romario Williams. They've been on the same team for three years now. <laughs> Nobody's going anywhere right this second. But I think Brandon Vasquez has passed Romario Williams for the moment. Yes, that's competition. That's what you want. In a perfect world, you're too deep at every position and you have competition for minutes every single week, every single training session. 
I don't think Atlanta's quite there. I mean, Tosis Martinez is the guy. When, when he's available, he's your starter. But Brandon Vasquez right now is the number two striker. And with the match against Toronto and most likely the match against Montreal as well, Brandon Vasquez has every opportunity to be the starter in those two MLS matches. And you continue building from there. And you go back to nine matches, 30 days. You're going to need Brandon Vasquez. You're going to need Romario Williams. You're going to need Andrew Carlton. You're going to need Justin Miram. All of the guys that you're seeing that you saw get wet last night that are not on international duty, that are not part of the the normal starting 11s that we've seen week in, week out traditionally in MLS play. You're going to need these guys. And to have them flex their muscles a little bit and show everybody that they're worthy of that time. I think it's, it's good for Frank DeBoer to see it's good for the fans to see. And for everything going forward, if you're trying to win a a cup trophy to have this roster depth, especially when you're dealing with multiple competitions and schedule compression, this is good stuff that we saw last night adding to everything going forward. The roster depth is an absolute necessity with this type of schedule coming up. And you're going to have to go 15, 18, maybe 20 deep over this next month against top quality competition. So Brandon Vasquez stepping up, good sign. Andrew Carlton, a couple good performances from him. This was a very different type of performance from him. He comes in late to preserve a lead. And you saw Andrew Carlton, 1v1 defending out wide on the right, doing a pretty solid job. He was beat once. I think he won his battles a couple of times pretty good night from him in a different kind of role on top of I thought what was a good 30 40 minutes in the first game of the open cup and and not bad the rest of it but a really good 30 40 minutes in that first match of the open cup so Andrew Carlton contributing Brandon Vasquez really contributing Justin Merrim contributing Breck Shea coming off the bench doing what like you said last night I think what you bring Breck Shea here to do come off the bench and be a, a valuable substitute in these types of moments, very, very good. Starters were, were good last night. Um, I mean, the usual suspects were the usual suspects. I thought Leandro gonzalez Perez had a good, very good night. Miles Robinson gets a goal off a set piece. Excellent defending from him. Franco Escobar just killing himself as usual, hustling, running. I know there's a lot to talk about with Pitti Martinez, and there's a lot of takes. I, I talked about it way too long last night. I think you guys know how I feel about that. Um, I didn't think he was bad last night at all. I didn't think he was as good as he was against Charleston. It happens. It's all good. I thought Barco was great coming back into the team. He gives you that lift, and he's playing with a ton of confidence right now, so you ride that. It's a good spot at the moment for Atlanta United. They've got a week to rest they'll be back in town today they'll get some training in this week and they'll prepare for toronto on wednesday toronto will be missing michael bradley they'll be missing josie altador who are away with the gold cup they'll be missing jonathan osorio who is away with the canadian national team at the gold cup it's going to be a depleted toronto squad atlanta will be missing joseph martinez at copa america uh not sure about the availability yet of julian gressel tito vialba I believe Doug Robertson reported last night that Vialba will be checked out by Atlanta's medical staff today. Get an update on his status for Toronto and beyond. Gressel, I think the idea was to rest him in these cup games so he would be available for Toronto after some muscle tightness, after a lot of games in a short period of time. And he was one who looked like he was feeling it at the end of that run of games. Let's take a break here. We'll get into some of your questions. It's a wall pass Wednesday. It's what we do. Tweet at us. Use that hashtag. At soccer down here. Wall pass Wednesday is the hashtag. Let us know what you thought about Atlanta last night. Let us know what you thought about the U.S. men's national team last night. We're going to talk about Greg Berhalter's 4-0 win with the national team. First win in Gold Cup play. We'll get into some of the particulars there. We'll talk about Women's World Cup as well. Uh, Two big games today that will help decide Group D. And it's a little complicated. FIFA's already prepared for the potential drawing of lots if everything is all equal at the end of the day. And that could happen. It's not completely out of the the realm of possibility. We'll get into all of those things and more right after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. 
High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Avalinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer down here, June 19th. Okay, we found an incident with Columbus fans from 11 years ago. There's nothing about batteries, so I'm still a little skeptical about batteries being thrown. But there was a game with the New England Revolution, and it was reported by Ivis Galarza, um, SBI Soccer now, it was soccer by Ivis at the time, that... Uh, Foreign objects were thrown, and and one of the things that ended up on the field was a lit flare, which is not yes. good. And no. reportedly, uh, some racial slurs were were hurled at a New England Revolution player. So, it's eleven years ago. There's there's, I'm going to think that the statute of limitations is up on that one, and I don't think that has anything to do with today. So, I've not heard about these situations with Columbus on a regular basis. Look, honestly, the. The talk has been, where are the Columbus fans? And last night, Open Cup, I don't know how every club around the league promotes their U.S. Open Cup matches. Whatever promotion Columbus did last night didn't work, and it's something that they do need to address. Some clubs don't take the tournament as seriously, both from on the field and off as others, and that's a shame. You also had bad weather forecasted for a long time leading into this game you had a week just at a week to promote it and sell tickets for it and you ended up having a lightning delay so a smaller crowd than normal yeah i totally get that completely understandable but yeah there was what 2,000 people there i think according to doug robertson on a uh, estimate did we get an official attendance last night Yes, eighty six fifty nine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I didn't think that uh, Montfrey Stadium sat fifty thousand people because that was tickets not sold near capacity. I mean, no, like why Season would tickets? people buy a bunch of tickets and then not use them? Season <laughs> tickets generally, they're not going to get tickets to every Open Cup game. I guess they could. I don't know. That's uh, unless there were things going on that you could not see on the broadcast. That number feels crazy to me. After the rain, look, I was just a little surprised that it was this empty, especially in the North Deck. After the the rain started, that that surprised me a bit. But it filled back in as the the night went on. It's save the crew. I don't think will completely look the way that. It should until they move into their new venue. I think it will be look better next year as the ownership group has time now to address what 
has not been working. They really didn't get a chance to come in with a big new strategic plan for 2019 because they didn't get a chance to even take over until the very beginning of 2019, very end of 2018, when the, the sale of the uh, operating rights went through. So they did not have the ability to revamp a whole bunch of stuff. They're going to need to because all of the things that were said when Austin came up, well, I mean, the numbers aren't there. The attendance is not where it should be. And that's a question. That's a question as to why. And it's a question as to why it's kind of dropped this year. That needs to change. And I think it will under new ownership who I think will invest more in terms of the promotion, in terms of just putting a quality product on the field and and running things in the right way because they're not looking to move the club. That will definitely help. I hope it has a big effect next year because I've been disappointed in in how it's looked. And, And I hope that changes. I think it will when they move into their new stadium. I really do. But that's not till 2021 probably midway through the season maybe late in the season so it's a lot of time between now and then and and things need to improve in the the stands in columbus and draw more than eight thousand six hundred whatever they said it was for the open cup round allegedly allegedly yes that's that's well sketchy numbers it looks like look at i mean just look at what the haslams have done with the cleveland browns Mm-hmm. And the excitement has, that has returned with a certain quarterback and making sure that your player personnel decisions are, are smart and that you're building a team the right way and hope that the, the same approach is taken with the crew when you have the time to actually sit there and develop your plan, get your guys in place and make sure that your philosophy is implemented as you're getting into a new stadium. So I, I, I'm looking at the Browns as my current example. I'm not looking at Flying J as my example, but I will look at the Browns instead going forward where the crew are concerned. Yeah, I think the track record is there that they will they will make a go of this and it, it definitely needs to change. Where do you want to go next? Do we have some questions on the Twitters, or do you have questions? We do. Okay. Well, no, I, I don't have questions yet, although I did find another incident in 2015. <laughs> okay, I think we've, we've got the picture. There there have been some things, probably like most fan bases. Um, there have been incidents in Atlanta. There have been incidents in most. I, I don't know yes. if it is an ongoing, regular occurrence for that for things to be thrown at referees in Columbus. I've I've not heard about that being a regular part of the Columbus experience. Yeah. No, but batteries, uh, I've there were beer about. Yeah, no. But there were uh, beer cans thrown at Rodney Wallace during the MLS Cup final after he scored in 2015. Yeah, I mean, and the other player players. and it's stupid and if I remember right it happened in front of their supporter section like right in front of them and they're pretty close i don't like it but these things do happen i think players expect it a whole lot more than referees do all right how far back in the timeline do you wish to go well i think we got everything from last night so whatever we have not gotten yet Okay, the commissioner has uh, come in early this morning and said that he had a clarification on his PT comment from last night. He said <laughs> it's not about PT working the ref. It's about PT not making back post runs when he was on that side and the attack needed a runner on the back post. There would have been two more goals. Yeah, that's not necessarily his game. Um, I would like to see more movement from him off the ball. I agree with that. Uh, a lot of the talk about PT was – he's soft What was one of the tweets and he needs to go to the bench and he needs to stop complaining and, and those types of things. So that's where the, the bulk of the conversation was um, more moving off the ball. I agree. It, it's not what you bring him here for, you know, you're not bringing him to, to be a, a, a guy who's making all kinds of runs off the ball. You're making, you're bringing him in here to be a guy on the ball. And it's, it is a different mindset. He's looking for the ball more to his feet. You want him to, get a little more comfortable in the system to play it into his run. I've, I've seen more of that. Not enough. The movement to be an option at the back post. One thing in with Pitti on the right and Escobar crashing 
overlapping him is often you're going to see Escobar as that guy making that run on the back post. And it's going to be Pitti trying to find either the, the pocket of space at the top of the 18 or dropping to give an option for a, a cutback as opposed to crashing the back post because we know Franco Escobar is going to be the one doing that. And when you compare the the styles and the skill sets, that, that is the way you want that to break down. I don't want Escobar on the ball standing at the top of the 18 with a defender in front that he has to beat on the dribble. I want Pitti in that spot. And if you're looking for somebody to, to make that run to the back post to finish something off, Franco has shown that ability to do that on a regular basis. So that's one part of it. And I have to go back and look at the specific situations the commission is, is talking about to see if Franco was there or not and, and why, because it might've been a situation where he just didn't make the run or he had made a run back to defend or whatever. And Pitti was doing his usual thing was to cut inside as opposed to make that outer run. Anyway, um, it's all good. I mean, again, we see things differently. We all have different feelings about it. I just think some of the criticism of Pitti is harsh, and I think it's getting a little like kind of nitpicking at times. And I just hope he gets a fair shake. That's all. I, I feel like at times he doesn't. Well, and I think a lot of it comes down to you're not Miguel, and the 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 fans adoration and love for Miguel Almiron and when you lose that player that it's like you don't want to be the the guy that replaces the legend you want to be the guy that, to, to be the guy that replaces a legend kind of a thing when it comes to coaching but uh, I think that folks are right now looking at this as okay well we love Miguel Almiron you're not Miguel Almiron and I'm hoping that folks will will warm to PT and embrace what he has br- what he has brought to the table and what he's bringing to the table yeah I, I get what you're saying, but two years is two years. You know, it's it, it's one thing if you're talking about replacing like Francesco Totti at, at Roma and, and people are kind of like, well, you know, he's not Totti. You're talking about, you know, 20 years, <laughs> two years, and, and they're different types of players and they do different things. I mean, even right. just their positioning is, is completely different. I mean, Miguel the team was built around what Miguel could do for this team playing as a non-traditional number 10. And I mean, go back. There were people saying he needs to be on the left, his speed. He needs to be a winger. (laughs) No, Um, he's a non-traditional number 10. I think he's a little bit more of an attacking eight. It's essentially the same thing but you were able to build a team around him to get the best out of him and let him do what he does. Pity now, and I think it's his best spot that we've seen him in so far, is wide on the right. I thought he'd be better on the left. He's better on the right. He's cutting into his strong foot, his left foot, and it also really fits well with what Franco Escobar gives you as the right back. Yep. So it fits and complements the team really well. It's a very different role. Than, than what Miguel Almiron was asked to do in this team. Pitti would not be successful in that role. Miguel would not be as successful in a role like Pitti has. That's just how it goes sometimes. But, I again, I just hope that, that Pitti will start to get a little more consideration, and it's not that we're looking for things to criticize him for. Look for things to praise him for, too because there's lots of good quality that he brings to this team. I mean, there was one sequence where I think he had a shot that was blocked at the end of it, but he beat three defenders at the top of the 18 in tight space. And it was just amazing talent to do that. So, Is it the run in the 50s? Was it that late 50s possession that they had last night? Possibly. Um, possibly. It was around then. but Going back to my notes. Yeah, somewhere around there. Um he was not bad last night. He was not as good as he was against Charleston, but he was far from bad. Hudson at the mile high 17. Barco's movement is so crafty and with purpose off the ball. Love his growth. PT has amazing quality on the ball and the confidence to try really complicated moves. I don't get the hate. Expect more, but encourage, not shame. Love these cup matches. Hashtag wall pass Wednesday. Yeah, you want him to try those things on the ball. I mean, that's that's one thing about the way the team is built this year is once you're organized and once you get the numbers forward after building your possession up in those situations, 
you're giving Pitti the green light to try stuff, and the players want him to try stuff because they know his talent. They see it every day on the training ground. Barco's different. I mean, I wouldn't say that Barco's you know movement off the ball and his crafty movement off the ball is, is what stands out about him. Um, he's picking up the ball in in good spots, but it's not from movement like you'd see from Franco Escobar making a long run and somebody splitting two defenders. Barco's picking the ball up where he's in a spot that is between the midfield and the the back line. He's he's getting in a, a space that's difficult to defend because it's either going to pull a midfielder out and create opportunities for Nagby or Remedi to step up into that space, or it's going to pull a defender out, which is going to create an opportunity for last night Brandon Vasquez, other nights Joseph Martinez, or the players on the outside to make runs. So it's it's a little different. I, I think what Barco's really good at is reading the game and reading situations and, and where to find that space. And he's really good at exploiting that space. That's a little different than than runs off the ball. But Barco, that part of his game is much better. And I think a lot of it is down to the confidence because he's he's trusting himself more in, in 2019. And that happens as you get older as a player, and it happens as you're playing well and getting good feedback as well from you know, scoring goals and, and getting that reaction from your teammates and your coaches, and you're given more freedom to, to play your game. I think Barco is in that situation right now where he is just in a great run of form. He is feeling it and playing on instinct, and it's working. I thought last night he looked as, as sharp and as confident with no hesitation as we've seen from him in Atlanta. And and that's great because he still has a lot of room to grow. He's nowhere near a finished product yet. Let's see. Uh, Jay Nams. For some of our fans, for lack of a better word, some of our fans, for lack of a better word, are just dumb. My theory is that most are only experienced with vintage U.S. men's national teams that prioritized grit, hustle, and pure athleticism over technical ability. They just don't know how to fairly analyze that skill set. Hashtag que loco que esta. No, I don't think anybody's dumb. I don't think it's that at all. But th- th- I think different people look at the game different, and they value different things. I mean, and that's not a Atlanta thing. That's that's a worldwide thing. If you look at at players like a Pitti Martinez, that exceptionally talented player with the ball at their feet, they haven't always been appreciated in England, for example, because that's not the the gritty game, the the up and down game. Possession soccer hasn't always been embraced in England. I mean, the the comments about Pep Guardiola after year one at Manchester City and the comments before he got there and somehow inexplicably some of the comments that still continue today. It, it's, it's different mindsets of the way the game has been played in that country. Germany is somewhat similar in that they they prioritize work and hard work but I think they look at it in a different way as England. Spain is a whole different ball game. Spain, and we've talked about it many times, Tata Martino wins a match 3-4-0, but he doesn't have 50% of the possession with Barcelona, and the fans are ready to riot. That's the complete opposite mindset. Brazil values different things in Argentina. That's common. That's okay. I, I think what we're starting to figure out in Atlanta and in the United States as a whole is, one, we're having these conversations. And we're figuring out now what is valued in the American soccer system and city to city. I mean, if you've grown up on Red Bull soccer, you're going to value different things than if you've grown up on Atlanta United soccer. 100%. Because it's different perspectives on the game. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. It's just you have to understand, I think, sometimes that players will come into your team that are not the prototype. And it's not a bad thing. Because you need those differences. You need that variety. Um, recently reading you know, books about the, the dream team at, at Barcelona, Johan Cruyff's team. And he brought in Risto Stoichkov from Bulgaria, who had the amazing 1994 World Cup with Bulgaria and carried them to the semifinals of that tournament. Well, Risto Stoichkov didn't fit the traditional Dutch game. And he was he was called uh, the the description was mala leche. He was like bad milk. 
but it gave them something different to what the rest of the group was. If everybody else is one way in this team, and can that win championships? Yeah. But sometimes you're going to need something a little different. Stoichkov was that for Barcelona. I think that's why the Red Bulls brought in Kaku, because he was different. You're not asking Kaku to run himself into the ground in a press for a full 90 minutes. Does he have to press some? Yes, because that's that's the way they play. But you brought him in there to be that player that when things broke down with the press, when you weren't able to press, when teams said, we're not, we're not going to play with the ball at our feet, so you're not going to press us, Kaku was the player who could be that difference for the Red Bulls than what they already had. Pitti Martinez is a player that is different because of just how talented he is. So you want that in a team, and you, you, uh, you set up a team to deal with that and to manage that. If you're going to be a pressing team when Atlanta presses, you don't want Pitti to, to burn his energy on that every time. Are there times when he has to defend? Yes. Are there times when he has to make runs off the ball? Yes. But he is here to win 1v1s and score goals and create opportunities for others. That's what he is here for. And he can do more of that, yes. He can be more productive in those areas, absolutely. But that's why he's here. He's not here to do what Eric Rometty does, or he's not here to do what Miguel Almiron did. He's here to do what he does. And and that's a that's the way I, the, the game is everywhere. So, it, no, fans aren't dumb. You have a lot of different fans with a lot of different levels of experience, but you also have a lot of different fans with different, expectations on the way that they think the game should be played or the way that the game they want the game to be played. And we've never really had that in in the United States, honestly, where you're seeing that Atlanta fans are starting to identify what is good soccer to them, what they like and what they don't like. And other cities are doing the same. That's good. That's good. I, I think as a whole, United States soccer needs to figure out what it is. And historically, it's been very closely modeled after the English game, after the German game, because those were the two primary touchstones for administrators, for coaches. And that was what you came up in. I mean, if you were you know young when I was or the generation after me, you could see some Premier League and and English League on TV and highlights at least, and you could see soccer made in Germany on PBS. Those were the things you saw. You didn't really see, unless you spoke Spanish, Mexico. You didn't see anything from South America outside of a World Cup. So those were the touchstones. That's what players were judged by. Now it's completely different. And it it does feel like a melting pot. And you look at this last U-20 team, and I think it shows that. I don't know what the American soccer style and mentality or good soccer for the United States is right now. And I don't know if we're how close we are to actually defining that, but I like that we're talking about it and starting to figure it out. Tafka. And I don't know where sarcasm font picks up in this. Uh-oh. The, the thing was bad for both teams, but it wasn't that bad. Chin scratch, eyebrow raising emoji. I'm, sure why there would be that much anger i don't know <laughs> i'm not sure i think that was it was from last night and it might have been referring to something we were saying or something else that was going on mm-hmm. um the the field itself is that we're talking, or the referee what was the first part refing the refing was bad for both teams <sighs> look he got out of there with 11 v 11 on the field i'll give him that um, I thought he needed to tighten things up a little bit sooner, and I had the same criticism yep. that I have with a lot of referees. I, I feel like they let too much physical play go on players who are trying to play, and I thought Columbus came in with a, a fairly clear idea of we're not going to let Barco and, and Pitti beat us, and we're going to go in hard, and we're going to go in late even if we have to, and we're going to make them feel this. That's a strategy. And if it's allowed, and I thought a player like Pedro Santos, I was shocked he wasn't on a yellow card. They did see a lot of yellows. They kind of came a little bit later in the match where they weren't quite as effective. 
I would have liked to have seen it called tighter earlier. That's the biggest issue I had with it. I would have liked to have seen a little more protection for Barco and Pitti. Those were the main criticisms I had. Uh, the Columbus criticisms, like I don't know what the the primary anger is around Columbus and what they wanted out of this. I've seen a lot talk about Leandro Gonzalez Perez, but in that situation, to me, the attacking player is putting himself into that dangerous position as much as Leandro Gonzalez Perez is committing any kind of dangerous play by the bicycle kick because JJ Williams sees everything developing in front of him, and he has a right to go try to win that ball as well. Leandro Gonzalez Perez is completely committed without Williams there. When he goes up, and I mean, once you've started to do a bicycle kick, there's not much you can do. I no. think it's the right no call. Now, have we seen that called? Yeah, we have. We absolutely have. Could it have been called? Sure. I think it would have been a, a bad call and a harsh call. So if that's the primary criticism, that I guess that's it. I don't know what else Columbus is is really upset about here. Daniel Price, the match was just a mess. Honestly, going to Columbus hasn't been the has been the best as of late. Water polo MK two. Very proud of Vasquez to quote Doug. See, he has become our Open Cup hero. Although Daniel did not use all caps. Uh, you got to use all caps with Open Cup hero. So I mean, if you want to start for that game on on the on July tenth, if you want to take Foreigners Jukebox Hero and do Open Cup Hero for Brandon Vasquez, uh, somebody run with it and have fun with that. All caps. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe we should have a a, a rap recap using that as the base as the baseline. Well, I don't know if that'd be as much of a rap recap, but. Uh, chant. Somebody create a chant. We need more chants for individual players. We need songs for players. That would be a, a great one for Open Cup hero Brandon Vasquez. And uh, Daniel's also excited to see who Atlanta United plays in the next match. Doesn't matter who. He expects a good and exciting game on an overreaction Wednesday. He, yeah, it could have been an overreaction Wednesday. I think we had our overreaction uh, show in the post-match show, so that's why I didn't go yeah. completely overreaction here. Um, round of 16, Atlanta will be looking at St. Louis hosting Cincinnati tonight at 830. St. Louis, good defensive team, pretty direct team, pretty physical team, good size. We've seen Cincinnati. We've seen Cincinnati start to fall apart a bit as well. I don't really know where Cincinnati will be by the time we get to July 10th. We'll see if they have a manager in place. We'll see if they've made some changes to that roster, at least are in the process of it. This game feels a little bit like a toss-up since it's at St. Louis as well. Uh, I I could see either one coming out of it. And either one coming to Atlanta on July 10th, Atlanta will be the clear favorite. Will Palmer, with all the talk about keepers getting second yellows and field players having to go in goal, who is Atlanta United's emergency keeper and which prominent field players have you seen in goal? I've seen a video where Harry Kane had to be a keeper, hashtag wall pass Wednesday. Yeah, I remember Harry Kane going in goal. Um, I mean, I think obviously in this situation for Atlanta, Leandro gonzalez Perez would be the guy, yep. right? I yep. mean, we, we see him Give me that. take penalties all the time. So if if you got into a situation and and remember – and this is some of the quirks of, of the way things are. Major League Soccer is not using the new FIFA rules until next year because the FIFA, the new FIFA rules started with 2019-2020 competitions. The first one was the U-20 World Cup. The Women's World Cup is using it. The Gold Cup's using it even though they're not using video assistant referees. Copa America's using it. The main part of that is the one foot on the line and the video assistant referee will be looking for that. Now, my my questions are, okay, so MLS is still on the old school way with, with penalties and goalkeepers are giant air quotes bigger than, you know, <laughs> bigger than Stone Mountain. Um, keepers are supposed to keep two feet on the line. <laughs> We've seen how that's gone. Are we still playing <laughs> under the giant air quote rules or is it going to be somewhere in between? I don't think, of course. No, I completely disagree. 
are they going to say that it's okay to have one foot on the line, even though technically in, in MLS the rest of the season are supposed to have two, even though they're not calling it that way or they haven't been? I'm intrigued to see where this goes, and I'm intrigued to yeah. see if MLS allows video assistant referees to intervene on goalkeepers coming off of their line on a penalty, even though they're not operating under the new law yet. And I don't think that they should yet. I wonder if it's going to happen. And when we get into single game knockout postseason, that'll be interesting. And if anticipate we get into the everything situation in the open cup, that'll be interesting. So I'm uh, a little scared, definitely intrigued, but if yep. you got into a situation where you had to go field player and goal, it'd be LGP. No question. And to we got a couple minutes before the end of hour number one, and then Daniel goes back to Justin Miram and wondering why they would boo him up there. He says it's stupid. Anyone who comes here, meaning to Atlanta, is a pariah to the league. Everyone hates us. Well, Atlanta is the most hated team in the league. I think that's one hundred percent true. Maybe it's just as simple as that because I don't think there's really another reason why you would boo Justin Merrim. I mean, he wasn't vocal in demanding a trade. He didn't have anything bad to say about Columbus at all. It feels like everybody won in that deal because Columbus got a roster spot and they also got some resources for Justin Merrim, who wasn't playing, and Merrim gets a fresh start. I have no idea why he would be booed for that. I just... I think it's silly. Orlando fans having a beef with Merrim, even though, in my opinion, they're the ones who, who caused the reaction from him. It's far more justifiable than Columbus fans booing Justin Merrim. That makes no sense. There, there's nothing to justify it other than we don't like Atlanta, so we're going to boo you. But how many times do we see these situations where a player goes to, it's not even a rival, just goes to another team in the league that and a player goes to the Yankees. They played for... I don't know the the Rays for yeah. Eight I was going to say Tampa. They played yeah. for Tampa for eight years. Say Evan go Longoria to goes to the Yankees. Yeah, and he comes back to Tampa. Does that mean they get to boo him? No, they're they're probably not. They're probably going to cheer him when he comes out. And he he might get the uh, the thank you Evan Longoria video beforehand. Yeah, Justin Merrim got booed, so that's kind of a shame. Um. That's it for hour number one. Hour number two, we've got to talk about the U.S. men's national team. 4-0 win last night to open the Gold Cup. If we learned anything, what we learned. Uh, we've got some other little news and nuggets around as well. We've got some Women's World Cup to discuss as we get ready for the finales in Group D. Hang out with us. We'll be right back after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it. Drowned it again and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update! I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. 
Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or calling 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. John's over here trying to claim the Rock's people's eyebrow again. I I don't think he understands that there is one people's eyebrow, and and it is uh, Dwayne Johnson, the Rock's eyebrow. When John raises his eyebrow, it's just John raising his eyebrow. All right. And the emoji is just a a raised eyebrow emoji. See, then the Rock just needs his own emoji then. Well, I mean, I don't think many... Does, does anybody have their own emoji? I don't think anybody does. And the teams have their own great. emojis what? or hashtags. Teams have their own hashtags. They don't have their own emojis. <laughs> There's a large difference. <laughs> yeah, not quite the same thing. Every people do have hashtags, yes, but uh, I don't think anybody has their own emoji, and that would be scary. Uh, a raised eyebrow is just a raised eyebrow. The people's eyebrow is held by the rock. Show some respect. Well, I, hey, he, he was the one who told me that he hit Charlie Ward so hard that he forced him into basketball. He's probably right. Made the, made the best financial decision Charlie Ward could have ever made by hitting him as hard as humanly possible in college. Mm-hmm. That's correct. But, yeah, that was a, that was a fun interview when we went back and forth back in the day. See, but he would... He would put you into the SmackDown Hotel if you kept talking about stealing the people's eyebrow. Well, actually, he tried to do that in the interview that we did. I'm not surprised. You probably deserved it if you were talking all reckless about people's eyebrows and such. Well, that that would be a modern-day discussion. Ay, Dios mío. All right. We've got some other stuff to get into, but we've got a lot from you on Twitter, and we'll get back to that very quickly. Uh, round to 16 U.S. Open Cup. Does not conclude tonight. There's one game tomorrow, LAFC hosting San Jose Earthquakes at 1030. But the rest of the games are tonight. Last night, Minnesota with a massive 3-2 come from behind win in Houston. Mm -hmm. Dynamo go up 2-0. Darwin Quintero goes nuts. Equalizer was spectacular. Winner after a run from Ethan Finley. Mason Toy puts it away in the 89th minute. And the Loons move on to the quarterfinals huge win for minnesota united tonight dc hosting nycfc at audi field at seven o'clock orlando city hosting new england revolution at 7 30 dallas hosting new mexico united on campus at smu at eight o'clock st louis hosting cincinnati at 8 30 portland hosting the la galaxy at 11 that is your nightcap I'm leaning towards St. Louis and New Mexico tonight. Um, it's a really tough one for New Mexico. I think it's probably a tougher one for them. Um, St. Louis Cincinnati's a toss up because Cincinnati is has not been strong. They're not a hundred percent. St. Louis at home, they feel like the kind of team that can grind out a one nil or grind out a scoreless hundred and twenty minutes and then win on penalties. They have that in them. New Mexico doesn't have that in them. New Mexico has firepower, and you can't count them out late in a match. So it's a little different in the cup. I generally lean to teams that are strong defensively, especially lower division teams that have an opportunity like St. Louis and New Mexico have. I think that stronger defense plays better at this at this point in the tournament. And I think St. Louis just has a more favorable matchup. They're at home as well. They get a, a weaker team in Cincinnati. They have the better chance of going through. New Mexico, score early and score often. That could mm-hmm. be a 4-3, 5-4 crazy game. On the bouncy turf at SMU. It's bouncy turf at SMU? Uh, that it is a uh, it is uh, If memory serves, that is an artificial surface that has uh, a lot no. of give to it. No. No? They're not playing in the football stadium. They're playing in the same place they played last week. Okay. I thought that was turf, too. 
Mm, I don't think so. All right. Bouncy? That doesn't even make sense. Yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, there was a lot of a lot of bounce attributed to uh, what I saw last time out when I was watching uh, action at SMU soccer stadium. Hmm. I did not get that impression. Sorry. Boing. Okay. Well, hopefully we have that doesn't questions. happen. Yeah, let's get into yeah, some no. questions. Okay. Uh, Daniel wants to know if Miriam starts over Tito. Uh, it depends on the injury. I mean, that's that's the number one thing right now is it depends on the injury. So today, yeah, because Tito's been banged up. Uh, when they're both healthy, I think it depends on the opponent. They give you completely different things. I think Tito's more of a goal-scoring threat. I think Merrim's more of a combination threat and creating chances for others, although both can do what the other one does. Merrim can score goals himself. Tito can create chances for others. But I think their strong suits are opposite, so it's going to be a little bit more about what the rest of the team needs and who the opponent is. I do think Merrim's a really good fit. I think maybe he's a better fit on paper than than Vialba, but Tito kind of has that... (laughs) <laughs> that Malaleche to him a little mm-hmm. bit, that he is that unpredictable element that you don't know what he's going to cause. And there's games where you need that. And I think teams that, that sit back and are going to put numbers behind the ball are, are teams that Tito can have a really strong effect on because he is unpredictable. And he's unpredictable on the dribble. He's unpredictable with his movement. He is anarchic. He, he, he's, he's anarchy on the field. And that can throw teams off. Merrim is not that. Merrim is going to fit into the system, and Merrim's going to play his role very well, and he can dribble, he can create. I think he's one of the better dribblers in the team. But he's a little more traditional, whereas Tito is not. And it just depends on what you need in the in the match. Kefsi says, it looks like at Longshoe is still prophetic in predictions. You correctly said Miles would score before Parkey and Brecken. I felt those guys tried to find their own game, find their own in the same game for an asterisk, but Robinson's header was worth the wait. Hashtag USOC 2019. Hashtag Wallpass Wednesday. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Um, it felt like he was getting closer, and it's a good finish from him in this one. Heads it, heads it down to the ground, Kempen with no chance. It's great service from Parco. I noticed more and more that Atlanta was trying to pick him out on corners as well. Um, he was a, a primary target on corners for a lot of May. So not a surprise that he gets his goal here. I don't think it's going to be his last one. I think his vertical is obscene, and he will continue to get these opportunities on set pieces because of that and because you've got players in Barco and, and Pitti who can pick him out. Joe Bost with a question for this morning. And he wanted to know what kind of contract Romario Williams is on. Just thinking ahead. Hashtag Wild Pass Wednesday. No idea. Uh, and that's the stuff is we don't know. I mean, we know now the uh, salary terms, but we don't know the length of the contract. So there's there's really no way to even know. Um, he's been here for three years now. He was a generation Adidas player out of college when Montreal grabbed him. Never broke through with Montreal um, regularly. He was in, on loan in Charleston. Then Atlanta picked him up. He was on loan in Charleston's first year under contract with Atlanta. He's in that that difficult spot, in my opinion, that he's done everything he can do in the USL Championship. He's had back-to-back double-digit goal seasons in his last two regular years playing in the USL Championship. There's not a whole lot more to prove there. But is he a day-in, day-out starter in Major League Soccer? I don't know. I think there are teams he could probably start for. But is he, no questions asked, starter? I don't know. He's kind of in between the two, and that's what's tricky. So, Romario's a good player, and he's had very good moments here in Atlanta. And we've seen him have good moments with Atlanta United, too, as well. And Charleston Battery fans they saw him have many good moments. 
But right now, today, and this could change next week, Brandon Vasquez is outplaying him today. Didn't see that coming because Vasquez had a good first year in 2017, banged up in 2018, couldn't see the field, didn't perform when he did. Early this season, didn't play well. Had a game in, in Charlotte with Atlanta United, too, that he could have had a hat trick and just could not finish. Got hurt again, and now he's back in the mix, and he's playing, he's delivering, and, and it's complete performance last night. You know, Frank DeBoer, what, what DeBoer said is, is high praise for what Vasquez gave you last night. That's going to be tough for Mario Williams to unseat at the moment because Vasquez is just playing better today. Long term, I mean, you've had the, the the two of them for three years now. Is is it a problem to have two forwards on your roster behind Joseph Martinez? No, it's not. But are you going to continue as Williams is older? Is there is there more potential for him to find another level, or are you going to go with a player like a Jackson Conway pushing into that kind of role as the number three forward and getting some of that time? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe Patrick Oconquo does. He is on a, a homegrown deal. Conway is on a USL deal. Is there somebody else coming through the academy? We don't know. Is there somebody you pick up in a draft? Maybe. And that's going to be the thing just as you get older at that at that level is you're probably going to get pushed by the young guys coming through if a club is building the right way. And, and Williams is going to get pushed. I do think he can start for some teams in MLS, but he just hasn't been able to find that spot of consistent playing time and consistent strong performances playing a lot of minutes outside of 2017 in Charleston. That was his best season as a pro. Let's see elsewhere on the board. El Mato Flo said he knew that uh, Trinidad and Tobago's kits looked familiar. This is a very old school NPSL Atlanta Silverbacks look to them. <laughs> Michael Cinco, do you find any of the Atlanta United transfer rumors to be credible or interesting? Hashtag Wall Pass Wednesday. How many are there now? I didn't know there were multiple ones. Uh, let's see. Robin. That's ridiculous. I, I don't see that one. Oh, and then I guess. Uh, the the current Barco ones, those have already been even thrown out, debunked, and I, Tito I honestly I can't. That's one. Yeah, of Tino de San Lorenzo about. because he sported the gear. Because he sported the, the gear, swag. I disagree with because he's he's done that since he got here. I mean, yeah. he was a a fan of San Lorenzo before he played for San Lorenzo. That side of it, and, and I remember a, a, a picture after a match last, it might have been, yeah, I think it was last year, might have been late 2017, where guys were, were holding up t-shirts or, or flags or uh, pennants or whatever of, of clubs they came from, and you had Miguel holding up a Lanus shirt, uh, I think LGP was holding up a River Plate shirt, so it's all good, like, I think I don't know why that's a that's something to worry about. Could he go back to San Lorenzo at some point? Yeah, I I think Tito Vialba will play for San Lorenzo again. I think he just has that in his blood. Is he going to go now? I don't know. Somebody's going to have to make an offer that would make sense. And I don't know if San Lorenzo is in a situation where they can really offer a whole lot. And don't know what Tito wants at this point. But posting a picture, you know, with san lorenzo swag i don't think means anything because that's been going on from day one is there something else going on not that i'm aware of that's all i've got there was a very loose rumor in the argentine media about san lorenzo would i think take him back or or whatever yes they would i think that's a no-brainer for them but is there a transaction that makes sense for everybody involved that i don't know and I can't think of any other players off the top of my head that have been linked to anything one way or the other. It's just the taking a picture, assuming something, putting one and one together and coming up with 11 kind of things. Yeah, it's normal. I mean, it's 
jumping to conclusions um, on situations. I, I think we're, we've been around the block a few times now in transfer windows to take some of these with a grain of salt. So definitely don't jump to those conclusions based off sport. What was the thing called on sport on decisions or whatever? I don't even think it was that. It was like sport recent, something strange. I mean, just just check your sources and then also check common sense and and think about it. And will there be more rumors between now and then when the transfer window opens? I would think so. LGP to Boca, that was another one that's come up a few times. Oh, and yeah. I believe right. popped up again in Argentina. Boca is looking to strengthen at center back. So if Boca made an offer, I wouldn't be surprised. And I it, at least it's been alleged that there have been conversations in the past. So would they be interested? Yeah, I think so. I do. Was there a deal to make it work that, again, it comes down to price it comes down to contract it comes down to, to lots of different things so i don't think it's a foregone conclusion if boke is interested that a deal gets done ani deportes did you see this one i did not okay uh wanted to see if we could pass the word around about what's going on with temecula fc in the npsl well, i saw the that chances are, yeah i saw about temecula and and they put out a, a post that they needed to sell 1500 tickets to survive i, I think roughly yeah. that that's what we're talking about yeah and then and, uh ani's question he's uh my question i guess would be for lower league team owners what lessons should they take to heart if you want to create a lower league team in the united states for me it is have multiple owners on board also have the ability for teamwork and commitment with a good budget. That is what is going to keep any team afloat. Um, you have to be well-resourced because it is expensive even at the lower divisions. I think you have to go in knowing that you don't know everything. Um, as somebody who has been involved in running an NPSL team, crazy stuff happens all the time and you don't necessarily know when or how, and you have to be very creative and resourceful to figure these things out. The The deal with the Temecula is concerning to me because you can't allow yourself to get to that situation. And I believe the owner said that he had spent $450,000 over, I'm not sure what the period of time was, to keep that team afloat. That's a lot of money at that level. And let's say that they sell the tickets that they need to sell to stay afloat. Does that mean they'll be back next year? So they needed to sell 1,500 tickets at $10 a piece to their match for the club to continue into 2020. It's a, it's a great story. And, and lower division teams are very, very important, but... Are they going to survive past that? And that's always my question. Is it sustainable? Because you can't pull this again. You know what I mean? You can't do this. We've got to sell 1,500 tickets to make it to, to next month or the year after. It doesn't work that way. At some point, people say, I, I bought tickets and I couldn't go to the game. I'm in Alabama. Why am I going to do it again? Why isn't it working? It's a business. Not all businesses work. And that is an element to it. And I, I know soccer fans don't want to think that way because we love the romanticism of the game, but it is a business. And just because somebody started a club doesn't mean they're going to be successful at it. Um, 18 hours ago, Temecula updated that they had sold 421 tickets. They're trying to sell another 1,079 to yeah. their final match. It's up to 440 now. It doesn't sound sustainable, and that's what worries me. I don't want to see a team go away. I don't want to see kids who are Temecula FC fans in that area have their team go away. But is it sustainable? And that's the number one question. And if, if it's not, can you create a plan to be sustainable? Because this is not a sustainable way to fund a team. 
it, it's not going to make it work year after year. I, I was trying to figure out what the period of time was that that four hundred and fifty thousand was spent, and and I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure because. I would want to know what their costs are year to year and how much of a chunk that this is going to, to be. Because what I'm a little worried about is that, okay, this works. It's successful. They sell $10 tickets to 1,500 different people, and that is trying to do math, $15,000. Okay, that's probably their league fees, and maybe their stadium rental for the season, depending on what kind of deal they have. If that gets you into 2020, you're still going to have to pay your referee fees on, on, on game days for your home games. You're going to have to travel to your away games. If you have paid staff, you're going to have to pay your staff. There's a lot of things that are going on, on top of this. So if this is successful, Temecula sells 1,500 tickets. Is every lower division team going to do this? And then is every hardcore soccer fan going to basically be hit up by every NPSL and UPSL and lower division team that is trying to survive? I, I hope that doesn't happen <laughs> because that's not a sustainable plan for a, a club. It, it can't be. A sustainable plan for a club is in your community the lifeblood of your people who are in the stands, but also corporate support, your owner's willingness and ability to spend and potentially lose money, invest in the club, and not see a return on that. It's tough. It's tough to do what any of these clubs are doing. But you can't just jump in and do it because soccer fans are obligated to support you. They're not. You have to put on a quality product. And you have to have a business plan. And I don't know what the business plan is for Temecula. And I don't know beyond the the, the tweet that they need to sell 1,500 tickets to make it to 2020. I don't know what the plan is beyond that. And I would I, I want to see more because it needs to happen. I mean, I know here in the South, and I can't speak to NPSL in California. I know there's more travel. But I know here in the South, when when the NPSL region started, the South region, which is now massive, the South region started with Rocket City United in Huntsville, Alabama. It started with a team in Greenville. I think they were Performance FC. And Atlanta FC, which was a team that we started. Three teams. All drivable. Even the, the Huntsville to Greenville trip, which was a long one, was, was drivable in a day. Chattanooga came in the next year. We know about Chattanooga FC's success. Um, Georgia Revolution came in not too long after that when they were based in Conyers. Now they're in Henry County. Birmingham had a team for a while. Uh, Knoxville had a team coming in around that time. But it was all about trying to stay drivable to keep costs down because nobody was making any money. So, okay, you can keep the cost reasonable. And when we did that team, we had... a uh, a benefactor who was willing to invest a certain amount. And those of us who were working on the team and helping run the team didn't make any money doing it. We didn't make any money until we partnered with the Atlanta Silverbacks and Atlanta FC became sil the Silverbacks reserves. And then I believe one season, maybe two, there was a little bit of a stipend from the Silverbacks. And that's it. I, I, yeah, there wasn't much. Um, and that's why one reason why costs were down, <laughs> because the coaching staff and the front office, which was me and the coaching staff, were, were doing it because we were crazy and we loved the game and we wanted to give opportunities to the players. Because at this level, it's about the players. You know, Junior Sandoval is still playing professionally with Las Vegas. He came through that team, started that team as a 17-year-old. That's why you do it. You're not doing it to make a ton of money because you're not going to. You have to keep costs reasonable, and you have to have a plan to do that. Our plan as a league and as a group, because we worked together and we we made sure that we were on the same page with this stuff, was to keep costs as low as possible. An opportunity came in to bring Jacksonville into the league, 
And the only way they could come into the league was to come into our region because there was no Florida region yet in NPSL. And we knew that long term, Jacksonville would be good because they would be that beachhead to start a Florida division. And you had to start somewhere because it wasn't going to happen overnight. And if you didn't take advantage of this opportunity, it might not happen for another year or two. So the, the conference as a whole bit the bullet and worked with Jacksonville. And they paid a little bit more for people's travel because that was not how that, that region was built. They paid a little bit more to come into the league a year before the rest of the Florida conference. And we made it work because we all collaborated on it. So nobody went out of business. And I think if you go back and look at the South region from when it started until it had the massive expansion and, and went into different parts of the South, you probably had the least amount of turnover in the NPSL because it was about sustainability. And at that level, it was honestly about nobody wants to stay in a hotel after a game. People want to be able to drive to a game and drive back that night because a lot of these players are students or working and you don't want them to miss time and you don't want to pay for a hotel. So how do you make that work? You create a league with teams that are drivable distances and you make it work and you work together. That hasn't been the case in other regions in other leagues and and the UPSL has this issue and every league has this issue because you have competing businesses, but the sustainability is the number one thing. And I want Temecula to survive just like I want every club that does this to survive. Not everyone will. And the ones that don't generally don't because they don't have a long-term sustainability plan. And it sounds like a great idea, but that doesn't fund a business, unfortunately. So we'll keep an eye on, on what's going on in Temecula. They have a lot of tickets to sell. Uh, that final match is June 22nd. So it's coming up, and they got to sell over a thousand tickets, and and that's what they're saying is the only way that they survive into 2020. So hopefully they pull it off, and hopefully they are also working on a long term strategic plan to survive past 2020, because just getting there is part of the issue. They've got to they've got to have a plan to survive way past that. Let's take a quick break and get into more from Twitter, and get into more of the U.S. Men's National Team right after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer down here, June 19th. Jason Longshore, John Nelson with you today on a Wall Pass Wednesday. So we're taking all of your questions. Had a lot of Atlanta United Columbus crew talk after the round of 16 match last night. Atlanta advances. They'll host the winner of St. Louis and Cincinnati on July 10th. And that match will be at Fifth Third Bank Stadium in Kennesaw. A lot of questions about Atlanta United playing at Kennesaw. 
I think it honestly comes down to the potential opponents and the cost of operating Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It has to be worth it to do that. And when you have a venue like Fifth Third, which is a great place to see a game, like it's... I think it's it's not even the same comparison to what some other teams have done where and we'll talk about Dallas for example. Dallas is in a venue that is about twice as big as Fifth Third Bank Stadium. And they they don't sell it out on a regular basis for league matches and they're playing their open cup match at SMU. It's a grass field I checked. It, it has great drainage I was I was told by I think their website. Could have been Wikipedia. Check. But I oh, think it's four four thousand seats, and it's all on one side. And when you watch it, watch the match on on ESPN Plus, it it doesn't look very big. Kennesaw does when there's people in it, when it's not a closed door match, and Atlanta <laughs> yeah. United matches. When there. you can hear the players who aren't playing yelling at uh, what's going on on the pitch. Yes, yes. Um, Atlanta United Open Cup matches there have had good crowds and loud crowds, and it's been a good environment. So when you have that option. Yes, then you can make business decisions again on is it worth drawing? I'd be curious to see what you would draw at Mercedes-Benz without it being part of the season ticket package for St. Louis FC in an Open Cup quarterfinal. I'd be really curious to see what that would be. Uh, U.S. Soccer does set some minimum numbers on ticket prices, by the way, and this is something that I've seen teams get crushed for when they don't sell tickets. Teams are very limited in what they can do with those tickets. If it's not part of a season ticket package like Atlanta did with Chicago, like you can't do a whole bunch of special sales on tickets, and a, there's a minimum price at a certain point in the tournament. It, it might be the semifinal. It might be the quarterfinal. So I, I think U.S. soccer needs to really figure out some different ways to, to make this tournament bigger. I think clubs need to invest in it more. In Atlanta's case, playing at fifth third, I don't think it's a bad thing because it's such a good venue for a game like this. I will love it when the tournament is at the point that doesn't matter who's coming to town in the tournament in a in a cup game that it's going to sell out the soccer configuration at Mercedes Benz. I'll love it when it's there. It's it's not there right now, unfortunately. So, um, U.S. Men's National Team. We've not really talked about this. Four nil win. Last I've night. heard of them. Yes, uh, they beat Guyana. A uh, little bit of a surprise in the lineup. Josie Altador not starting. Jossie Zardis up top. Walker Zimmerman and Aaron Long were your two center backs. Matt Miazga did not start. Rest of the lineup was roughly what was expected. Uh, Tyler Boyd gets a goal. Paul Ariola gets a goal. It's a good one. Jossie Zardis uh, gets a goal, although I don't know how much he really knew about it. No, <laughs> or how much he remembers. Yeah, um... How good of a performance was it? It was all right. It wasn't unbelievable. It wasn't bad. It was a little slow to get going, which was maybe my biggest concern. Let's hear what Greg Berhalter, manager for the USMNT, had to say after the match. Greg, can you speak a little bit about uh, the process of of evaluating Michael through the week and a half of of what he may or may not have been capable of and, and giving him the armband tonight as well? Yeah. No, it was tricky. Um, I think the the biggest concern was just pushing the minutes. You know, we know he hasn't played in a while. Um, and, you know, to go into the game with basically two planned subs is also very difficult because then you only have, you know, one extra guy. And it, as it turned out, Weston, Weston did go down. So, you know, that was our last sub. And, you know, you don't like to go into a game like that, but that is what it is. Um, he's been out a while and we wanted to protect him. And, um, you know, we plan to take both him and Christian um, off at a certain time. The decision to make him captain tonight was an easy one. Um, you know, when you talk about nerves of a first uh, first game in a tournament, you know, Michael's been through this, you know, probably a dozen times. So, you know, I, I told the guys to lean on him, you know, talk to him, talk to him about uh, his experience. And um, and so, you know, that's why and that's why I went with him tonight. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Coach, what went into the decision to start Zardes up top tonight, and how do you think he performed? So, you know, one thing that you're always going to get with um, with Jossie is, is a work rate, and I thought he, you know, he worked really hard today. Um, you know, Josie's a player that is um, is getting up to full speed. I think he's done a great job this camp. You know, 
when I talked to Josie before the Gold Cup and, and talked to him about some of the expectations for him, you know, he's exceeded every every expectation that we had of him. Um, you know, really working hard, um, great team guy, and um, you know, we're excited to start integrating him. You know, when you have two planned subs, it's very tricky to to start someone else that you're you know you you're, you're thinking you're going to have to take off. So that was why um, Josie didn't start, and, and I think Jassy did a good job. It's a great explanation on on the decision not to start Josie Outdoor when when you go into the match and you know that. Michael Bradley's not going to finish it, and Christian Pulisic's not going to finish it. You can't start Josie Altador. You, you cannot do it because you're not sure if he's going to be able to finish it. Bradley starting it as the captain, I don't even know why there's a question anymore about Michael Bradley being the captain. Who else would be? Yeah. like let, Let's be real about it with that lineup. Who else would be the captain? I don't – Tim Ream? That's about it. I mean, unless you want to put it on Pulisic right now, and I don't think you need to. I think you want Christian Pulisic to play his game. Eventually, could I see Christian Pulisic as a captain of this group? Yep, I could. Right now, you don't have to do that to him at this moment. You have Michael Bradley there, and as Berhalter said, Bradley's been through this. He, he's been there, done that. He's the type of person you want here. And you know, okay, you've got those two. You know you're going to pull Bradley at, at – he ended up pulling him at the 62nd minute. Will Trapp comes in. That's a like for like. You know you're good there. You wanted to start Bradley here to set the tone. I thought it was effective. I thought you needed to do that. He had a, a great ball to Tyler Boyd that ended up Boyd finding the back of the net after good 1v1 work. Pulisic coming in a little bit later than the rest of the group. Fitness not quite the same. He'd had a little bit longer of a layoff, so it makes sense that you're going to pull him. You bring on Christian Roldan. It was okay. It yeah. wasn't a great performance. It took a while is maybe the thing that would concern you the most. I mean, you look at, at stats and you don't learn anything from it. It's 60-40 possession-wise, maybe a little more possession for Guyana than you would have expected. Boyd with two goals, Areola with one, Zardis with one, 20 shots, six on target, four shots, one on target for Guyana. You, know, you look at the numbers and you're like, oh, it's a little bit closer game than, than I would expect. Don't know if it really was. Um, I would have loved to have seen the U.S. come out and maybe hit the ground running a little faster. It took over half of the first half to get on the board first. It really took that long to get consistent chances too so we'll see how they build from here it's it's a start it's not a bad start it's not a great start i don't know how much you really learn out of it um it's okay and now we see where the team is as they go into game number two of the tournament and you start to look ahead it's going to be trinidad and tobago on saturday night at eight o'clock more competitive we'll see how competitive it is but more competitive Panama is the match on Wednesday of next week. In the other game last night, Panama won 2-0 over Trinidad and Tobago. So it's U.S. and Panama top of the group. Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana on zero points. Both of the winners get a chance to go to six points in the next match. Probably favored to do so. And then you have U.S.-Panama in a match to finish the group where both of them are through and neither team really has to show very much. I don't know if that's a great situation for the U S honestly, John, because I think the more they're tested right now, the more we might learn about this group. And I think the more I think they'll learn about each other and the more they'll learn about, you know, how they're playing in these moments. If you get the Trinidad game, which will be more of a test and you get a Panama game that, I mean, you're essentially playing for positioning in the, the knockout round kind of wish they were going to get pushed a little bit more in that third game. Yeah, and you almost wish that the schedule was reversed. And yeah, get it would that, have been nice to start get, with Panama. Get that test there. But Burhalter after the match, said, you know, it was a start. It was a first step. Uh, and you just hope to continue to progress from that. So, you know, looking at the match while we were doing the post-game show over my shoulder last night, it took about 25 minutes, 25 or 30 minutes for – the the u.s engine to kind of figure out what it was doing and guiana hung tough for a while but uh yeah i'm looking at the the order and it's like all right how are you gonna 
go with match two and then it's like up down up down up down so yeah i wish the the schedule was reversed a little bit and really i look at this match and sit there and go yeah okay it was a match it was the first match in a tournament and there you go so not really a whole lot i can take from it other than the fact that it was a win took you a while to get up and running where do you go from here? How do you improve? And it was the point that we made yesterday. You know, look for improvement from the friendlies and look for a progression. Don't necessarily look for the the high, the high marks and all of that stuff that uh, you might want to see. It's just kind of temper, temper your expectations a little bit and look for growth as opposed to an absolute rocket start. Good one tonight in the Gold Cup at 1030, Mexico and Canada both coming Ooh. off of strong wins in their first match. Canada trying to make a name for themselves here at the Gold Cup in 2019. That could be a pretty decent match. I think Canada will test Mexico. Mexico should end up winning yeah. probably like a 3-1, 4-1 type of situation, possibly. But Canada could could be a surprise tonight. So I'll be checking in on that one along with some Open Cup action this evening what else do we have on the twitters plenty sir okay. well let's do it uh the colonel comes in this morning i continue to be struck by the similarities between the freddie adu described in the espn interview and the pt that we see depending no, too much no, on incredible no. talent not adding enough hard work i fervently hope the result is better for our pt hashtag wall pass wednesday it's they're not the same and and to compare Pitti to a player like Freddie Adu who said he was lazy and said he's out of shape. Pitti's not out of shape. Pitti's not lazy. Pitti is not coasting on his talent. Pitti is not making bad decisions on the clubs to go to and being too arrogant to accept playing time at a lower division club like Freddie did. Freddie made a lot of his own bad choices and I think he had bad advice. They're nowhere near similar. And, and it's a I think is a little bit of a scary thing to compare them because it feels like something that people will run with and it is so far from the truth. Not even close. Freddie Adu never got anywhere near lifting a Copa Libertadores crown, never got anywhere near the highs that Pitti Martinez has had at River Plate in rivalry matches with Boca Juniors, big moments for a big club. Freddie Adu never had any of that. Freddie Adu, his whole career was promise, and you'd see glimpses. Um, he was not a vital part of D.C. United's 2014 MLS Cup win. That might be the only championship team that Freddie Adu was on. He wasn't a critical part of that team. He was 14 years old, and he was a substitute. He was held out of playoff matches as a teenager by Peter Novak at D.C. because his head wasn't right. He went to RSL, then he went to Europe, and then he's just bounced around. So nowhere near the same comparison. Nowhere near the same comparison. It's it, no. Not even. <laughs> so you're saying no. No. It's, it's no. It's not even close. I mean, you're talking about a player that did what he did in the Copa Libertadores for River Plate and lifted the trophy. You're talking about a player that has represented Argentina at the senior national team level. You're talking about a player that was voted by not an Argentine publication, but by El País in Uruguay, the South American player of the year for 2018. Freddie Adu never got near anywhere, any of that. Nowhere close. And they're not the same type of player other than some people think Pitti's lazy. And he's not. People thought Joseph Martinez was lazy too. I think I think sometimes we need to maybe redefine what we we are expecting out of players because I don't want Joseph Martinez running around like a an unskilled player who's trying to make a name for themselves. I don't want Pitti Martinez doing the same thing. Do not want either one. And let's see, we've got folks going back and forth. Apparently, Breck Shea was being booed last night in Columbus as well. That's fine. Uh, that, that's just booing a, an opponent. I mean, it's toe. Good, good for the crew fans for booing Breck Shea. I don't know why they picked on him, but fine. There's yeah, nothing wrong with that. Now, apparently, 
according to Ike Man, Ike Man, it was from an Atlanta quote end quote fan that was it was happening. What no? It was an Atlanta fan booing Breck Shea or an Atlanta fan said uh, Columbus fans were booing Breck Shea? Both. Well, Why would an Atlanta so we fan have, be booing I, Breck Shea, first off. I don't know. Ike uh, Man says it was a very distinct voice all game long. You could hear him cheering for Atlanta yelling at Shea. That's just dumb. And we've covered this type of stuff. Yeah. It doesn't make you a uh, better fan to boo your own players. Stop. No, that. that's that's silliness. And Breck Shea's done nothing to be booed by Atlanta fans. Like, I, I don't understand some of this mentality that maybe it's a way to prove how hardcore you are, to, that you're not just going to cheer all your players. That's kind of part of supporting a club. When you hear clubs and you hear fan bases that are struggling and their fans are singing and chanting for their players the whole match. That's what you hope to see. Are there times that players need to be criticized? Yeah, 100%. I don't think a, an Open Cup match where Breck Shea did nothing wrong and hasn't done anything wrong to be booed. It makes no sense. But it hasn't Silly. made any sense, some of the reactions to his name all season. So... Guys, like I, I don't know. I don't understand it. Atlanta United has has done everything you could ask them to do in two and a half years. They've won a league title. They've competed in Concacaf Champions League. They've invested more than maybe any other club in in U.S. history out of the gate, and not just on crazy salaries to players. They've invested. Talk about sustainability. Signing a player for nine, ten million dollars and then selling them for twenty plus is sustainability. And then going and signing the South American player of the year. And oh yeah, there's another guy, Ezekiel Barco, who lit things on fire at the U twenty World Cup as well for Argentina and is now being linked to any club you can imagine. This is two and a half years. And people are getting bent out of shape about a player that you signed that was an MVP candidate in this league at one point, went to England on a a transfer, went to a a bad club and was in a bad situation, and has come back into the league and played for two awful teams in Orlando and Vancouver and was fine. And people are going to boo him because... And people are going to boo the South American player of the year or say that he should be benched or say that he doesn't hustle enough because, guys, there's a lot of clubs and a lot of fan bases in this country and in this world that would kill for the situation. So I don't I don't know. I, I don't I don't know what it is. I don't know what's causing it. There's a lot of really special things going on with this team and what you see on the field day to day and and what's happening and. It's just a little surprising, like some of the negativity that I don't see where it's coming from. I don't get it. We talked about it on the show last night. When you compare defending MLS Cup champions the year after winning a title, Atlanta United's start through 15 games is better than anybody since Real Salt Lake in 2010. It's hard to have six weeks off, come back, even harder in Atlanta's case where you have a new manager and you lose your best player and you add another super talented player but again things don't happen overnight and they've had the best start better than the LA Galaxy teams that won titles better than the Portland Timbers better than Toronto better than Seattle better than Sporting Kansas City better than anybody since Real Salt Lake in 2010 after winning the 2009 title You lost in CONCACAF Champions League to the team that ended up winning the thing, and you didn't get blown out, and you didn't get run off the field, and you competed over both legs. There is really not much to complain about. There just isn't. That's not a bad thing. So I hope that that attitude changes a little bit, and I I do believe that it is a a vocal minority, and it's easy to get distracted by it, and I'm, I'm probably guilty of it right now, but... It's happening a lot. I hope it does go away. And I hope that when players play p- 
poorly, we have a conversation about them playing poorly, not nitpicking things and, and not booing Breck Shea for being Breck Shea, which makes no sense. I don't know. Just strange. It, it's it's just strange. And I think part of it is just the growing process and the learning process and figuring all these things out and what it's what it's like to see this team day in and day out and live with a team day in and day out. But it doesn't have to be a negative vibe. It really doesn't. And there's no reason for it to be here. And Nick Hinckley has come in behind that conversation and off of the Justin Miram post where uh, Justin referenced everything that had gone on. He says, Nick, that the booing of Breck Shea was supposedly now from Columbus fans when he was subbed for Miram. And they said they weren't booing Miriam, they were booing Breck. So it's we're we're getting it from both sides here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Both are silly. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah. I got nothing. I don't know which one is right. sillier. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Price agrees that LGP is the guy to be emergency goalie. He says also with a uh, crying, laughing emoji that Parky is now my official number nine, hands down. So Daniel Price asked a question. I don't. I don't think you you put it this way yet. Um, jumble the lineup and put players in random positions. Who that was going to be next. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. let's let's go ahead and see that. So because he says LP, LGP in the net, Parky up top, Gazan on the wing. You get the idea. So if I'm going to do this and say, okay, you can't play your normal position, but I want to play you in a position that I think will work. I'm not just completely randomizing it because okay so that? yeah daniel price put it in the randomizer you're gonna do it in positions that work well I, yeah because i mean if it's just the randomizer i mean let me just pull names out of the hat so lgp in net because we've seen him do that in training sessions and he's not bad all right so that's our goalkeeper so we'll, we'll stay in the four three three um joseph martinez is a center back undersized yeah. but he's got the vertical and he, he'd be good in the air and he's scrappy so i think he'd be good in the tackle if he had to uh, we'll put joseph at center back um paired with him that would not be an ordinary center back but could do the job um probably the best easiest one would be eric remetti because it's he's another scrapper but i would worry a little more want some height so i would go breck there and pair Breck with Joseph at center back. Um, left back. I mean, the easy solution would be to play a winger as an outside back because there there's some similarities in what they do. So, I mean, you could play Justin Merrim as a left back. You could play, can't play Julian Gressel as a right back because he's played there. So we're not going to do that one. Um, go Tito at right back. So and Gressel's kind of out of the whole conversation because he's played so many positions that it's almost not yeah. fair because he's got experience top. playing everywhere. Well, he played there in college, so I'm not I'm not going to even go there. Um, I will go. So that's our back line is Tito on the right, Merrim on the left, Breck and Joseph at center back. All right, up top. Who would be somebody who would never play up top, but I would put Parky there. Miles. No, I'd put Kazan there. I'd put Kazan there. Because then, all right, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna play Brad, you got size up top. Decent with the feet. Probably pretty good in the air. I mean he's a big guy. Set pieces, he's gonna be a handful. And I, I probably would rather if if I'm easy, if he's in my eleven, I'm going to put him there rather than put him out in the wing. I don't I don't know if Brad running on the wing is something I want to see a whole lot of. <laughs> um, I'm going to play Parky as the number ten in the hole, spraying passes. I think Michael Parker's could be a pretty good uh, playmaker in that role. Um, out on the wing, Miles can run. I mean, Miles as a as a defensive midfielder is is almost too easy. So I don't want to do that. I'm going to put Miles on the right side. Let him run. Defend up top. I mean, you're going to be a pretty good pressing team <laughs> with your defenders up top. So then Miles cuts inside with Tito on the overlap? Yes, it creates that opportunity. So Miles on the right side on the wing. I need holding midfielders. Um, you know, I'll put Barco into a holding midfield role. 
I it's it's not something I would ever really want to see on a regular basis, but you know, the scrappiness that we've seen out of him here lately, could he play that role if you had to? Yeah, probably decent. Probably better than like I'm gonna trust him there more out of what we've seen than than Pitty as a six, um, than Carlton as a six. We've already put Joseph into a position. Uh you, you could put Brandon Vasquez there with his size. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Barco. Well, we'll go Barco and Vasquez. We'll go Barco and Vasquez as the holding midfield behind Parky. We've got Miles <laughs> on the right. So on the left <laughs> side on the wing, who would never play it. Um Florentine Pogba. We'll put Pogba. So we got we got size on the wings. You can play direct to them and they can hold it. You got Parker spraying passes. You're going to get overlaps with your outside backs, and you've got Big Brad up top to uh, head everything home. There you and go. And Florentine There's Pogba your... will launch with any opportunity on yes, net. Yes, he'll shoot if from he's within anywhere inside a the attacking mile line. and a half away. He'll shoot. Hundred percent. There's your random lineup with a little bit of logic to it. Uh, Tafka has posted his thread for Opus Part One. Okay, so let, let's, let's talk about this real quick. It's over at SoccerDownHere.net. Um, go read it. We have had so much other stuff today. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow. But Tafka, I called it an Opus because it's an Opus because there's five parts to it. It's definitely an Opus. You gave a Cliff Notes version that is 16 points. <laughs> <laughs> it's an his cliff notes are an opus on the it opus. A, it is a tweet opus about an opus. <laughs> That's just hilarious. Um, it, it's Tafka's thoughts on MLS and expansion and and how the league should be structured going forward. I don't agree with all of it. There, there's a lot I agree with. So we'll get into that tomorrow. But go go check it out over at soccerdownhere.net. And thanks to Tafka for taking th- something that we've talked about a lot on the show and, and putting it to paper and putting these thoughts in part two will go up by the end of the week. And then we've got parts, I think three, four and five coming. Wow. Yeah. I told you it's an opus. When, when the tweet thread about the opus is an opus in and of itself, it's an opus. It's the Iliad and the Odyssey of soccer down here. One of those. I don't know if you want to compare it to that. Didn't they end badly? Well, I'm just because of length is what I was referring okay. to. So okay. War and Peace or something like that. How about that? Okay. I was trying to think of something that was rather thick when it came to what we were forced to read. I mean, this, this, is, not, uh, this is not anything out of European history. This is, this is straight up long form uh, Encyclopedia Britannica stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, it's in that ballpark. Um, all the opuses. <laughs> wow. Uh, Jane Ams still stands by his stance. Some of the fans are dumb. He says, I argued with a guy that said the All-Star Game was a better showcase for Barker than the U-20 World Cup with Brett Kate, Lazy Joseph, etc. And now PT compared to a do so many takes that, and I don't know what that emoji is. Describe it. I, I want your play-by-play on the emojis. Uh, wide open mouth and a hat that I can't identify. <laughs> I don't think the hat has anything to do with it. I think it's a shocked emoji. Okay. All right. So shocked emoji with a pink hat. Well, actually, no. <laughs> when when you look at it, I would have said shocked. I'm wrong in it. It's it's called the exploding head emoji. Ah. Okay. I, so exploding kind of head emoji, emoji. Hashtag when really black guys. When you've got like pink stuff coming out of the top of the head and it's the exploding head emoji that's kind of gross okay it's like the scanners emoji yeah i guess so um people people have some interesting takes it it does happen from time to time um everybody comes at it from a different perspective so i i don't like to call people dumb i don't like to say that you know if i disagree it's dumb like no that's that's not true ah are there are there takes that I very strongly Vehem- disagree with? Vehemently yes. disagree with? Yes. Yes. Yes, it happens. And that's that's okay. 
and uh, Tafka has uh, given it a title. He says, A Tale of Two Cities slash Leagues. There we go. That's pretty good. I like that. Better than the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Price says his thought process for Parky up top is he's like Wando, maybe. Lots of skill, good on the ball. And he almost has scored lately. See, I like him as the 10, though, because of his passing. So I, I would have him, because I don't think there's anybody else. Like, if, if we're talking about Miles and Pogba and Brad, I don't want any of them as the playmaker. <laughs> I want Parky as the playmaker and trying to set those guys up. Let's see. Have we talked about Women's World Cup all that much? Uh, we have not talked about it all that much. Three o'clock today is when we get back into it from France. It's Group D finishing up. It's Japan and England and Scotland and Argentina. When you look at it, top two teams go through. England and Japan are on six points and four points, respectively. Argentina's on one. Scotland's on zero. Scotland cannot go through as an automatic qualifier. They could go through if they beat Argentina and flip goal differential a little bit. And one, if a 1-0 win, that would put them ahead of Nigeria on the third place rankings of getting in. Four of six third place teams get into the knockout round. So it, Scotland is not out of it by any stretch. England, I feel like, gets a result here and gets through. If they win and Argentina wins, there's actually a scenario where Argentina can get in as an automatic qualifier. And if that happens, then Japan would get through with four points as a third place. If Argentina wins with four points, they would get through as a third place. I think England beats Japan. I think England's just a better team. And I, I, I do worry that they come in maybe a little overly defensive here just to get a point to secure the, the top spot in the group. I think they should go for it for at least 60 minutes and, and try to find a winner and then, then hold whatever you have after that. Argentina-Scotland could be really, really interesting because Scotland has been, in my opinion, the best team that's lost two games. I think they've been good but not good enough against the top two teams in the group. Argentina's been impressive in a completely different way. They've been very tactical, very defensive. They haven't looked good going forward. They're going to have to show something going forward against Scotland. They're going to have to open up a little bit more. I think Scotland can score goals on Argentina if Argentina opens up. If Argentina doesn't open up and really rolls the dice, could they get through with two points if they get a draw? Mm. They could. It's not likely. But that would mean that they'd have to be hoping for Cameroon, New Zealand to draw and Chile, Thailand to draw. And they would all be on one point, and then Argentina yeah, not would be on two. It could happen. It's not something you're going to play for. But Argentina, I don't think, is a team that can play wide open either. I don't think they're good enough to do that. So they're going to have to open up more and look to hit more on the counter, but not too much until a certain point in the match. You know, if it's scoreless at the 70 minute mark and you feel like a goal, there's a goal in it. Go for it, roll the dice. Argentina-Scotland is a incredibly intriguing match. England-Japan, I think England just takes care of business and gets the win. Japan's been a little disappointing in this tournament for me. I'm still blown away by Brazil yesterday. I'm blown away by the last 10 minutes of that, including stoppage time, where you can go for it. You have no reason to worry about conceding a goal because you are going through... There's not about any seeding with the third-place teams about how many points you ended up with. You're just a third-place team that goes into a slot. You could have conceded. You were still going through a goal, and you're going through as the number two team. And instead of playing most likely France, you're going to be playing Norway. And they sat back, and they didn't go for it. It made no sense. And I don't know if that's on the manager. I don't know if that's on the players. I don't know if that's on the communication staff. I don't know if they just weren't paying attention or if they were just out of gas. I have no idea. But it was the most baffling thing I've seen in a tournament in a long time. There was no reason not to go for it, and they didn't go for it. And instead, and Nick Alifi is going to have to explain this to me, how this role reversal happens. Brazil doesn't go for it. And Italy, who has nothing to gain at this point is going for it. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. Like, it makes no sense. 
it makes zero zero sense and I'm, I'm having flashbacks to the 82 world cup and one of the best games in world cup history on the men's side with italy and brazil when they did the group stage in the second round with three teams brazil only needed a draw to go through italy had to win and that 82 brazil team is one of the most talented teams in history but they didn't know when to stop going forward They'd had a draw, and they just keep going forward and keep bombing forward, and Paolo Rossi scored three goals, and Italy ends up winning and knocking Brazil out. This time, it's Italy with no reason to attack that's attacking, and it's Brazil with every reason to attack not attacking. I don't understand. Calling Nicolifi on the, uh, we need the the SDH bat signal to uh, Well, there's no explanation. I mean, Italy just going for it at that point, it's like, why not? I mean... It doesn't matter. You know, they didn't have to sit back. They weren't risking anything either, but it's normally not their nature to go for it, and they were, which is great to see. The Italian team's been the biggest surprise in the tournament, and I can see this Italian team making the semifinals. They get a game against a third-place qualifier. It's probably going to be China. It could be Nigeria. Yeah. That's a win for them. It should be. Then they get a match in the quarterfinals against... Probably either Canada or the Netherlands. Tough match for Italy, but a match they can win. And then you're getting into a level that I think they'll struggle to compete with. I don't think they can compete straight up with the U.S., with France, with Germany. I think with England as well. I don't think Italy is at that point. But they can make a semifinal here, absolutely. And I would love to see it. So hopefully that can happen for Italy. Um TV ratings in Italy have been very, very good. I've seen some back and forth about people in Italy not knowing the tournament's going on, but then also the ratings are really good. I think 3 million people watched the last time on public TV, not even getting into the the cable stuff. So that, to me, has been one of the biggest stories about the Women's World Cup is numbers like that in Italy, which has not been a hotbed for women's soccer, in Argentina, ratings for matches against England have been huge. In places that you would not expect, this tournament is a success. And that's very, very cool. And I think you're going to see this be a bit of a jump-off point for women's soccer around the world. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we haven't discussed. I think we are caught up on the Twitters. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yes. Although Tafka says an Opus tweet of an Opus just means our our, – show planning is easier we have uh, hashtag thursday thoughts for weeks Uh, that's true we do have thursday thoughts for tomorrow um we have lots to talk about let me make sure we caught up on everything uh if you are driving in downtown or midtown atlanta um watch out for peachtree street is closed due to a gas leak you got 14th and 15th oh i can get i can find my way in there i'm I'm, yeah you've got you can come in through the prado and you'll be all right i got all kinds of ways to get in there but Yes, uh, midtown traffic is not good at the moment in Atlanta, so watch out for that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So appreciate everybody with all of the tweets and conversation. I, I Last love having, night and today. Yeah, all of it. I, I love having these conversations. I, I love that you know you guys give us the forum to to do this, and it's it's cool to see the evolution of of soccer in Atlanta and it is evolving and it will continue to evolve. And it's not for any one person to define. It is a, a process and it is a, a longstanding process, but I think it's really cool that we're, we're talking about what's good, what's not good, what we want to see, what we don't want to see. And, and I think it is something that will benefit soccer in the country as a whole, as, as more of these conversations are had in different parts of the country. And, more um as a, on a national level as well because you know i don't know what people want to see the united states play like other than win which yes but is greg berhalter's style of play acceptable do you want to see a pressing style do you want to see a counter-attacking style do you want to see a direct style i don't know if if that's really been truly discussed or or even understood to that level so It'll be fun as we continue to have these conversations, and thanks for being a part of it. We we could not do this without you guys listening and, and consuming all of the ramblings on that we have from time to time. Amen.
So, with that said, I'll be rambling on over at 92.9 The Game. Uh, 120 with the midday show, Andy and Randy. 2 o'clock with stoppage time uh, with a special guest, Kelly Francis, joining us from the Unrelegated podcast and our World Cup dates and the Queens of the South. Mike Conti is on vacation. Kelly's sitting in today, so we'll be talking Women's World <laughs> Cup, but we'll also be talking Open Cup. What? What was so funny you, about that? You, Jason... I mean, you, Jimmy, and Kelly. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, that is, I'm laughing in anticipation of what is going to be said and how it is going to be said. Okay, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, that's a high expectation we have to hit. So we'll be talking on Facebook.com/slash 99 The Game at two o'clock, and you can get your questions in, and we will be covering all of that this afternoon. We'll be back tomorrow with talk about an opus and talk about Open Cup, and talk about some Mexico-Canada Gold Cup, and Women's World Cup, and everything else. We'll also have a World Cup date uh, around the dinner time hour. Thanks, everybody. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata.